How do you try a murderer in a case where there is no body? What if an overwhelming amount of evidence points to one person, but the victim's body is never recovered? Can you be sure your suspect is really guilty? And can justice truly be done for the victim if they're never laid to rest properly? My name is Brandy, and today I'm gonna to tell you about the murder of Leslie Herring. Leslie's case made headlines in February of 2009 because her body was never recovered. However, a suspect was still arrested and charged. Murder trials without a body are rare. An unofficial estimate states that there have only been 300 such cases in the United States. These are difficult trials for prosecutors, as without a body, a case hinges heavily on circumstantial evidence. Would the evidence surrounding the disappearance of Leslie Herring be enough to convict her murder? Leslie Herring was 44 years old and worked at Simplex Grinnell, a fire alarm and security company in Los Angeles. She was well liked and respected by her fellow employees. Many of them gave her their old construction hard hats when they moved on to different work or retired. Leslie kept every single one of these hats on a well-organized shelf above her desk. She was by all accounts a creature of habit. Leslie called her mother every morning to pray, kept her home neat and tidy, and almost never missed a day of work. When these patterns were disrupted, when Leslie didn't call her mother or show up to work, her friends and family began to get concerned. Leslie's sister, Asha Davis, is an actress who has appeared on Grey's Anatomy and Friday Night Lights. When Davis received a call from Simplex Grinnell that Leslie hadn't shown up to work in two days, she instantly knew something was wrong. It made me nervous and uncomfortable because it didn't sound like her, Davis would later testify. She doesn't just go anywhere without telling anyone. She likes doing the same thing all the time. Doing something new is unusual for her, Davis said. So who do the police first look to in a missing persons case? the spouse. And in this case, they wouldn't need to look any further. Lyle Herring, 56, worked as a recruiter for California State University, Northridge. He and Leslie had been married for 11 years. They'd met at a 99 cent store and instantly made a connection. Lyle showed Leslie around town and the two seemed to get along very well together. They were inseparable. They married within a year of meeting and looked to be genuinely in love with one another. Leslie and Lyle went everywhere together and even dressed alike. Leslie's mom would say that Lyle was closer with her family than he was with his own. Despite this, there were differences between them that would lead to problems in their relationship. What are some major differences that can lead to relationship problems down the line? Most involve money. Others involve personal habits such as cleanliness. The Herrings case would include both of these. Leslie was extremely organized, had a steady job, and was fiscally responsible. Lyle, however, was the complete opposite. He had trouble holding down a job and constantly found himself with money troubles. Leslie confided in her mother that Lyle's financial insecurity was putting a strain on their marriage. From the sound of things, he may not have even been pulling his weight around the home. Her mother replied, what did you expect? You met him in the 99 cent store. But there was one major issue here. Lyle Herring was also missing. He would not be found for another two weeks. Could something have happened to both of them? Was it possible that both of the Herrings were victims here? In the meantime, police would search their home. The Herrings lived in a gated condominium in Hollywood. By all initial appearances, nothing was amiss. The house looked very clean, very nice, except a couple of things that we noticed offhand, LAPD detective Chris Gable said. One example of things not being quite right in the Herring home was some spilled candle wax on the counter. This may seem like a small detail at first, but from what the police had learned about Leslie from her family, that was likely not something she would have left home without cleaning up. An important find for the police during their search was Leslie's 1998 red Toyota Corolla parked at home. Within it was something even more concerning regarding Leslie's disappearance. Her purse, ID, keys, money, cell phone, and ATM card were all inside the trunk. Being as organized a person as she was, it didn't make any sense for Leslie to leave these important items behind if she left voluntarily. But had she left voluntarily? 
Also discovered at the home were Leslie's favorite bracelets. Leslie was known to wear her favorite Guyanese gold bracelets every day. They were found inside a different purse on the floor of her closet, along with a Starbucks receipt dated a few days after she disappeared. Leslie's mom knew she would never leave her purse there. Leslie believed in an old proverb, purse on the floor, money out the door. The saying comes from feng shui, an ancient Chinese practice that seeks to harmonize individuals with their environment. Essentially, the idea is that the floor is a bad energy place to leave a purse. Practically, it means that floors are dirty and impractical places to leave valuable belongings. So for someone as obsessed with tidiness as Leslie, it's unlikely she'd leave her favorite bracelets in a purse on the floor, let alone leave home without them. Other than the signs that something was amiss at home, the police had nothing to go on. There were no signs of Lyle or Leslie Herring. Was it possible that both Lyle and Leslie had been taken? Had there been some sort of accident that landed both in the hospital, or worse, in the morgue, with no identification? Then, a week after the police conducted their search, Lyle was pulled over by a customs officer as he tried to re-enter California from Mexico. Detectives had plenty of questions for Lyle regarding why he was in Mexico, but their most pressing question was, where is Leslie? Lyle would tell investigators that he and Leslie had plans to visit Rosarito Beach for Valentine's Day. Rosarito Beach is a resort town in Mexico, known as a nightlife hotspot for American visitors due to its proximity to the border. They'd had an argument before they left, and she ran off. She ran off without telling anyone at all? Did Lyle think the police and Leslie's family would buy this? Lyle said he decided to continue on to Mexico to see if she would meet him there. He then stayed there for an entire week. But Leslie's family had never heard of this vacation in Mexico from her. Leslie was a meticulously organized person who told her family everything. Would she really take a spur-of-the-moment trip without telling her family, friends, or even employer? Additionally, Leslie's sister, Asha Davis, had just given birth to a son. Leslie would never walk away from her sister and nephew when they needed her. Something was wrong with Lyle's story. When the police spoke with Lyle, they also noticed that his dreadlocks and goatee had been shaved off. According to Lyle, he'd owed money to some shady characters, and they shaved them off as punishment. This baffled the police. As Detective Gable said, I worked the gang unit for several years, and I've never ever heard of some gang members holding someone down to shave their head and shave their goatee off, so that was a first. Despite all this circumstantial evidence, the police had no real reason to keep Lyle detained, so he was released. In their search of the Herring's home, the police had also found a letter written by Leslie. The letter was addressed to Lyle. Within it, Leslie expressed her concern over some of Lyle's poor financial dealings. Had Lyle found the letter before she meant to share it with him? Maybe she just used it to get her thoughts together before confronting him. Was this what they had argued over before Lyle ran away to Mexico? Leslie's mother would further tell investigators that Leslie had told her she'd been thinking of leaving Lyle. Was it possible that Lyle had discovered that Leslie was thinking about leaving him? Maybe Leslie had even confronted him and he reacted poorly. Exactly what happened is still unknown. But then the police started to catch some breaks. Remember the Starbucks receipt found in Leslie's purse? The same purse holding her favorite bracelets suspiciously left on the closet floor? It had been dated after she had disappeared. They hurried to check the security footage of the Starbucks before it was automatically erased, expecting to see Leslie. Instead, they only saw Lyle, alone, purchasing a drink. Detective Gable would later go on to say, we thought that was pretty suspicious. Was it really designed for us to find that? Maybe it was meant to be discovered much later in the investigation, when the now old footage would have been automatically deleted. They suspected Lyle planted the receipt in Leslie's purse in an attempt to guide the investigation away from himself. In the moment, Lyle probably felt this was a brilliant attempt at throwing off investigators. As it would turn out, this was only the start. Lyle's attempts at misdirection would be his undoing.
There were several calls logged between Leslie's phone and Lyle's phone during her disappearance. However, Lyle failed to take into account how closely cell towers can track a phone. Records showed that the phones were in the same general area as one another when the calls were made, as if Lyle had held both phones in his hands and simply dialed one from the other. Another big break came in the form of Lyle's search history. Some searches included profile of a mass murderer, violent death and the soul, and 10 common methods of suicide. Other were relevant to his flight to Mexico, such as U.S.-Mexico border, U.S.-Texas-Mexico border, and do I need a passport? He also visited websites called which country do I flee to and what's the weather like in Belize? Do you think these are the internet searches of an innocent man, or are they those of a man trying to flee from justice? Police would then speak to people in the Mexican resort town of Rosarito Beach, where Lyle had been for the first week of Leslie's disappearance. He'd shown up there with his dreadlocks and goatee already shaved off, asking about buying a nightclub. A real estate agent he spoke with would later testify that Lyle claimed to be a millionaire. According to the agent, Lyle said he had a lot of money that would be available shortly. Lyle spent a week in Mexico before returning to the US. Why did he come back? Was his money running out? Maybe he feared he hadn't done enough to cover up his crimes. Back in the United States, Lyle was still trying to push the story that Leslie had run away. But her family and the police were having a hard time believing that she had dropped off the radar to escape him. These claims only made him look more and more like their suspect. Additionally, Leslie's family was finding Lyle harder and harder to get a hold of as he dodged their calls. If he was truly concerned for Leslie, wouldn't he want to work with them to bring her home? Unless bringing her home was truly impossible. Lyle's cousin, Malcolm, then told the police that he'd met with Lyle at the Herring's home shortly after Leslie disappeared. According to Malcolm, Lyle was acting erratically and saying things like he was going to burn in hell for what he did to Leslie. Malcolm was unsure of how to react and feared for Leslie's safety. He asked Lyle if he could use his bathroom in a ploy to get inside the condo and check on Leslie, if she was even there. Lyle considered it before telling Malcolm he didn't think that would be a good idea. With the sense that something was very wrong, Malcolm left. What would you have done in Malcolm's shoes? Was there anything different he could have even done when confronted with an erratic Lyle? Another cousin of Lyle's, Marvin Thomas, would go on to testify against Lyle. Marvin said that Lyle had called him several times on the night of February 7th, the night Leslie disappeared. Lyle was apparently frantic and said he was tired of everything and wanted to check out. Marvin agreed to meet with Lyle at a nearby Denny's. There, Lyle would also say that he would burn in hell and couldn't come back from what he did. Recall Lyle's internet searches, violent death and the soul, profile of a mass murderer, and 10 common methods of suicide. Is it possible that Lyle really was concerned about his soul? Did he feel genuine guilt or did he fear the prospect of going to hell? Was the search about suicide to help cover up the murder or was it for him? Marvin would say that Lyle looked to be wearing a gun holster with something in it. He was afraid of saying the wrong thing to Lyle and just wanted to get out of there. While leaving, Marvin said he witnessed Lyle place a large plastic bag in the back of his car. The bag appeared to contain a woman's maroon sweater, white tennis shoes, and a pair of blue jeans. Neither Marvin nor Malcolm would confront Lyle during their encounters, likely the smart thing to do. Who knows how poorly Lyle may have reacted in that situation. Next, one of the Herring's neighbors would come forward to the police as well. Around midnight, the neighbor saw Lyle wheeling a dolly way down the hallway to a far back elevator. On the dolly, Lyle had a rolled up carpet. The neighbor estimated the carpet to be wide enough to contain a body. The neighbor said that Lyle had a crazed look on his face, a hoodie pulled up and was sweating profusely. Lyle apparently either didn't see or didn't acknowledge the neighbor. The police then called for assistance from a cadaver dog. Cadaver dogs are specially trained to pick up the scent of human remains. They function similarly to search and rescue dogs, but are used to find dead bodies instead of living people. 
This four-legged detective was named Indiana Bones. She would be used to investigate the Herrings condo, as well as both of Lyle's cars, an old Cadillac and a Mitsubishi SUV. Detectives would get a positive hit from Indiana Bones on both vehicles, the trunk of the Cadillac and the back of the SUV. The cars were parked about 200 yards apart in separate garages of their condominium complex. Detective Gable reasoned that after Lyle had killed Leslie, he'd first taken her down to the Mitsubishi SUV since it was parked closer. He then drove her body to the Cadillac in the more distant garage. There, he dumped her body in the trunk until he knew what to do next. How long had he left Leslie in the trunk of the Cadillac? We don't have a definitive answer. But once Lyle figured out his next move, he put her body back in the SUV and drove away to where he'd dispose of her. This was why Indiana Bones got a decomposition hit on both of Lyle's vehicles. But where was Leslie's body? Where did Lyle go off to? The police knew Lyle was their murderer, but they wanted to find Leslie's body before arresting him. Recall how difficult it is to get a conviction on only circumstantial evidence and no body. They put a surveillance team on Lyle to track his movements. The team even planted a GPS tracker on his cars to see if he'd return to wherever he disposed of Leslie. It's fairly common for killers to return to a site where they left a victim's remains. Some derive pleasure from it, almost like visiting a private holy site. Others, like Lyle, do it to make sure everything is alright still and they're not about to get caught. Sort of the murder equivalent of, did I remember to close the garage door when I left? With Lyle's many attempts to cover up his crimes, checking on the place he'd left Leslie's body was something he was likely to do. He was clearly paranoid about getting caught. Luckily, that meant he was likely to slip up. A few days later, Lyle would inadvertently lead the police to an isolated area of Griffith Park around 6 a.m. Griffith Park is a large Los Angeles municipal park in the Santa Monica Mountains. It's most well known for being the site of the famed Hollywood sign. The location Lyle drove to in the park was about three miles away from the condo he'd shared with his wife of 11 years. Indiana Bones was then called in for assistance once again. The cadaver dog would give the police a positive hit on a dirt mound about 15 feet away from a dumpster. The mound was dug up, but no remains were found. The good work of Indiana Bones could only get them so far, and her involvement in the case would now be over. But the police owed that cadaver dog a lot. Much like the positive hits on Lyle's cars, this find from Indiana would tell the police that human remains had indeed once been on site, but no remains were currently there. What could possibly have happened to them? Police couldn't even confirm that it had indeed been Leslie's body. Per Detective Gable, it's Griffith Park. There's a lot of bodies that get dumped there. But what about the nearby dumpster? The police had a theory. Perhaps when Lyle had returned to the site of Leslie's burial, he'd exhumed her body and transferred her to the dumpster. Maybe he feared that the location he'd chosen wouldn't be a sufficient hiding place. Judging by the stellar work of Indiana Bones, he was right. The trash from the dumpster, along with Leslie's body, would have been taken to a huge LA city dump. From there, recovery was likely impossible. The police were now confident, with near certainty, that they would sadly never recover the body of Leslie Herring. But they were just as confident that Lyle had been her murderer. Despite missing a body, the most important piece of a murder trial, the police went forward. After 14 months of exhaustive investigation, the police appeared at Lyle Herring's Cal State Northridge office. There, they arrested him for the murder of Leslie Herring. Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney Sam Huelfeld handled the prosecution. The challenge, Huelfeld said, was most murders start and end with a body, and here we had to build a case without one. The police and the prosecution saw that all the circumstantial evidence pointed to Lyle. They could only hope that the jury would agree with them. Huelfeld opened the trial by saying, this is a case about a senseless and callous murder of an innocent wife by a calculating husband who tried hard to get away with it. Concerning the lack of a body, he went on to say, 
It's a case about how that regular middle-aged woman vanished abruptly off the face of the earth four years ago, never to be seen or heard from again, because that husband that killed her got rid of her body successfully. Furthermore, it's about how that husband then started weighing his options, looking for a way out, and planning his escape from justice. Lyle Herring would plead not guilty. His defense attorney, Marvin Hamilton, would say, what this is, and nothing more, is a missing persons case. The case, he said, was built on loose circumstantial evidence. Would that loose circumstantial evidence be enough to convict Lyle without a body? Both Leslie's family and the police hoped so. According to the prosecution, Lyle thought to cover his tracks immediately. They brought up the Starbucks receipt found in Leslie's purse, and the video of him actually making the purchase. Lyle was trying to push that his wife had left him, but no one was buying his story. Lyle had also called Leslie's mother and left a message asking about her whereabouts. At a news conference, he had even played the part of the distraught husband. There, he had been in full view of her family and the police, both of whom strongly believed him to be guilty already. The prosecution also brought up Lyle's trip, or perhaps more correctly, his flight to Mexico. Witnesses testified that he'd shown up in Rosarito Beach with his dreadlocks and goatee already shaved off, maybe to give himself a new look in hiding. The real estate agent he'd spoken with even testified that Lyle had said he was very wealthy and would have more money coming in shortly. Was Lyle just acting erratically in doing so, or was he really hoping for some kind of payout? About a dozen witnesses would testify against Lyle Herring. These included his neighbor, who testified that Lyle had been pushing a dolly with a rolled up carpet down the hallway to an elevator on the night Leslie disappeared. Lyle's cousin, Marvin Thomas, also told the court about his strange meeting with Lyle at Denny's. There, Lyle had mentioned that he thought he was going to burn in hell and appeared frantic and unstable, scaring Marvin. Thomas also testified that Lyle had placed a large plastic bag in the back of his car that contained what looked like a woman's maroon sweater, white tennis shoes, and a pair of blue jeans. This would be the same car that Indiana Bones, the cadaver dog, got a positive hit for human remains on. Was Leslie's body in the car the whole time he was meeting with Marvin, or had Lyle already disposed of her and was now getting rid of the clothing separately? If so, why? We will never have a definitive answer. During the trial, Leslie's brother, Lyndon Telford, would tell the court that Lyle was telling a ludicrous, self-serving tale devoid of any credibility. He further implored the jury that since Lyle had shown no mercy or remorse for Leslie, they should show none for him with their sentencing. Lyle Herring's trial lasted three weeks. It did not take the jury long at all to reach a verdict. On April 8, 2013, exactly four years and two months after Leslie had first gone missing, the trial concluded. The jury found Lyle guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Both the judge and the jury found the circumstantial evidence against Lyle to be overwhelming. According to Detective Gable, Lyle's efforts to cover up the murder were what got him in the end. Maybe if Lyle had just stayed home, Leslie's murder would have never been solved. He would have been much better off if he did nothing. Then we'd have nothing to go on, said Gable. It was his cover-ups that really solidified the case. Lyle's own paranoia about getting caught was what would lead directly to him getting convicted. Leslie Herring's remains have still not been found. The only person who could possibly help is Lyle himself. Police and family remain hopeful that one day, Lyle may do the right thing and Leslie can be laid to rest properly. For now though, Leslie's family and friends can rest easier knowing her killer is behind bars. The murder of Leslie Herring was a brutal and awful act by her husband Lyle. However, his many attempts to cover his tracks only made it all the more disturbing. While likely not premeditated and thought out, Lyle did put a lot of work and effort into trying to throw investigators off his trail. On top of it all, Lyle seemed convinced he was going to hell for his actions. If he knew his fate after death, why was he so concerned with getting away with murder in life? Furthermore, why hasn't he ever revealed what really happened to Leslie's body? What do you guys think happened? Are the police most likely correct? Is Leslie's body now unrecoverable in an LA city dump? Or is she buried somewhere in Griffith Park? 
please let me know in the comments. Regardless of where her body is, we can only hope her soul is at rest. Thank you for watching another episode of Killer Bites. I'm Brandy. I'll see you next time.